Hello everyone. So um, I provided that content four or five weeks ago and uh, I was preparing these um, like one week ago. Um, actually I changed the content a little bit but I think it's going to be more interesting not less. Um, the reason being I was thinking instead of talking about data which is actually the raw input why not we just talk about the scenario or we talk about what we see and what we can change in terms of our day-to-day -day business decision making and how do we think about this. So um, to start with that's why I changed the topic a little bit I'm sorry about this. Um, let's talk about conversational AI because that's the you know field I'm working on as well as the tech driven future which is how technology software is changing how we behave how future might be formed and uh, just a bit of an introduction about myself I'm an FIA as well so I was trained as actuary get my qualification but later I realized or oh, maybe I'm just a you know more interested in software um, however deep inside I'm still an actuary <laughs> um, so my, my journey so far um, as an introduction, I was an actual analyst at Suncorp in Zurich. Um, that's also the place I met with uh, John Shen. And then I moved into Quantium um, on uh, retail analytics, uh, mainly helping retailers and uh, large supermarket to automate certain decision making. I was mainly doing the algorithm side, working with the team in Sydney and in India. Then uh, in 2017, I started my first startup. I was the co-founder CTO. Along the journey, I started picking up different um, weird skill to most factories such as PyTorch, Python, Scala, Java, which is pretty much programming. Um, and um, the company went relatively well. We had our first round of fundraising backed by Westpac's Venture and uh, Airtree, which is the largest VC firm in Australia in 2017 which was 1.25 uh, million and the second year which is like literally two years ago um, we had our second round which is series A uh, 17 million AUD uh, backed by Sequoia China. So uh, last year I finished I resigned from the board and left Hyperina and took a break and started my current business. Uh, the main driver for this was fundamentally I see Conversational AI is my true passion. I really want to put 100%, not just 20%, 30% of myself into this. Um, that's how I started with, with Curious Thing. I'm the co-founder CEO. So um, just to give you guys a bit of like a flavor, because for most of the people, startup sounds like um, I'm not sure if you guys watch the you know uh, Silicon Valley um, TV show. I think for most of the people, you know, startups are like that. But uh, well, kinda. Um, so just give you guys give you guys a bit of flavor what could happen um, for a startup within the first year. So we uh, we were co-founded by three people July uh, 2018 last year, and that the left hand side that's a photo. Um, you know, myself, Dr. Han, who's our CTO, and David, who was my mentor and who's our chief strategist. And, um, you know, within the year, we achieved uh, a number of things. The first one is uh, we had our first client, which is CSRO, and we had our first round of fundraising, which was 1.5 million from uh, Reinventure, Westpac, and Quagro, which is uh, a Singapore-based VC. And then we started rolling out to more clients. So far, we have completed actually more than this. Even last week, we did 1,000 interviews. So, so far, we've completed around 7,000, 8,000 interviews with real candidates. Um, some of the ca uh, clients, including uh, PwC, DBS, Amazon Web Services, and uh, Commonwealth Government. Mm -hmm. So, we have a very small team, 13 people. Uh, we work in a, you know, co-working space um, you don't 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 have the guys you don't have the things you guys usually have um, you know sometimes the aircon doesn't work mm -hmm. but so far it's fine so um, today's agenda I'm gonna talk about um, you know all different topics um, I'll start with natural language processing to go back to the topic of this forum um, because we want to talk about data natural language processing is actually a very important stream of not just artificial intelligence but also data uh, itself and then uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit of like what um, you know what I personally see regarding how software or technology, especially conversational AI, is forming our future. As um, you know, for us, what can we do to kind of like uh, be part of it and um, you know grow with it? And I'll finish with a QA. and a <coughs> So. NLP. So uh, if you search for NLP, there are two things online. Uh, the first one is what 
as data scientists would call it, natural language processing. And the second one is some neuroscience stuff. I don't know what's that, but when I refer to NLP, uh, it's natural language processing. It's very simple to understand. It's basically how to use um, you know, a certain uh, you know, machine-driven process to deal with natural language and make sense of it. Uh, it doesn't have to deal with from unstructured to, struct to structured data process. It could be all different ways. It could be just you know, uh, semantic mapping. It could be summarization, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a very important subfield of artificial intelligence. Uh, if, you, if you guys really think about the Turing test, it's actually just focused on natural language understanding. And um, you know, it deals with how human and machine interact with each other. And um, you know, the relationship between NLP and the conversational AI I'm going to talk about today is very simple. Natural language processing is the core power uh, or enabler of conversational AI application, but of course itself, it doesn't mean much. It's algorithms, it's um, you know, just lots of quants and math. Conversational AI is more like as application, what does it mean? Think about Siri, it's a kind of like application of conversational AI. And under the hood, it's powered by uh, Wolfram Alpha's algorithm primarily. However, without, you know, the wrap up, without the, you know, the, the speaker you guys have on your iPhone, uh, well from our fast algorithm, you know, is can be delivered in a different way, right? So uh, why does it matter or why does it matter to us? Because most of us actually, you know, your day-to-day -day job doesn't really need to deal with natural language data. Um, the, the, the simple reason is if we really think about, you know, everyone is talking about like data is the future, you know, we need to build our kind of like a skill to, to um, you know, to make the future better and analyze data. Um, the reality is today when most of the people think about data, they think about, you know, relational database. Uh, some of you guys might think about Mongo, uh, you know, document database. Um, but anything goes back to a database actually is constrained by the structure. So however, most of the data we were or we should be thinking about is data is data. Data is the result or the trace of our day-to-day -day interaction. When you leave a certain thing on Facebook, um, that's data. Uh, how is that stored? That's the secondary question. So uh, reality is 80%, actually more than 80% of the data um, we have today are natural language related data. Um, you know, think about the PDF, think about the word, think about when you try to um, find a job, um, the JD you look at, um, you know, uh, even think about like, you know, the, the label of your clothes, they are all data. However, how do you actually make sense of this data is a real challenge. For a long time, uh, as human beings, our approach was always let's make sense or make sense of the structure first, and then we deal with the data. But um, you know, later on, with the development of all the natural language processing toolkit, there is a different approach. People see it. People see it in the way that okay, let me deal with the problem first, and then I go back and think about whether that there is a right or wrong database. Um, Cool. So um, just to give a very brief idea about like some classic NLP problems. Before I do that, I just want to tell you guys, I work with a lot of NLP experts, but myself, I'm not. I'm familiar with a lot of tools. I've done some development, but I don't have a PhD in natural language processing. Um, however, some of my team do, so I just borrow some of their things into this topic. The first one is very simple, machine translation. Um, one of my, uh, my lead data scientist, uh, Dr. Yasmin, um, her uh, PhD thesis was uh, very interesting. Um, it's basically how to translate English into a summarized version of Aboriginal language. Um, you know, it's, I, I don't know how she does it, but you know, it's, it's fundamentally, you know, using lots of like, you know, traditional sequence to sequence way, but also some sort of like smart. So, um, but if we take a step back, machine translation is fundamentally to deal with language one, to some sort of like a machine process than language two. And um, you know, what's, it's, this problem is pretty much solved. Today, most of the machine translation um, problem we are dealing with, they are pretty much all right. And uh, most of the problem we are still having today when you use application is more application layer problem. It's not algorithm, algorithm layer problem. The second one is information indexation and uh, retrieval. Um, this one is simple. It's more like, you know, how do you actually get a certain information out of a, like a huge amount of a document? Um, if you think about, there are lots of companies doing um, enterprise search. Uh, I don't know if you guys use Jira in your own company. 
if you do actually um, Jira internally, they are trying to figure out a way to say if I search for the HR process, for example, or uh, how do I report my manager? I'm not saying you should, but say <laughs> you want to say I, how do I report my manager? Um, and then under the hood, actually, maybe there is no document talking about how do I report my manager, but it's talking about something you know using a more formal language, such as how do I um, whistleblow? I don't know. Um, then how do you actually build these connections so that you can actually do the information retrieving um, is a, a real question. Then the next one is more like information summarization, such as um, you know a massive uh, news article. How do you quickly use your machine to summarize it? without losing the main context. And lastly, it's uh, semantic analysis and ontology research. Fundamentally, you know, what's ontology of all the questions? How do you automatically generate questions? So this is a part, actually, uh, we have three, three provisional patents on this, and this is a part my company put quite lots of effort in. Um, so um, let's talk about conversational AI at more application layer, and why does it matter, and why, um, you know, as a, as actually, I could have a, like a better life. Why do I want to do a startup working, you know, 14 hours per day, six days a week, just do this? Uh, it's because we actually see a very interesting trend, and we believe we can be part of this. Uh, if you think about like 20, 30 years ago, um, web was a, like a main interface when we interact with a human, uh, with a machine. Um, so you go to website, uh, you go to your computer, you type a certain thing. Then later, mobile become a new thing. Though they sound very similar, it's a screen you type, but it's very, like the fundamental logic is different. The fundamental logic is when you have a certain need, what you, what you look for. Um, however, today, um, well, actually starting from 2015, you will see more and more conversational AI interface. Um, you know, think about Alexa, uh, think about, you know, the Google Home. Uh, think about today in your car, actually, uh, you press a button and you can say, take me home. It will realize it. Uh, okay, uh, you're, you're talking about navigation, take your home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, fundamentally, it's because we see a um, you know slightly different way, or you know under different scenarios. Maybe as human, we don't want to see the physical interface, but we want to have the interface. And for lots of ap applications, voice-based interface makes sense. Um, and um, and I'll give you more idea regarding you know. Let's talk about conversational AI. Let's talk about like a voice-based interface. Why it is happening and what make this whole thing happen. Uh, this will include lots of like you know technology talk. If certain concept you are not familiar with, uh, feel free to ask me in the Q and A time. I don't know whether I'm allowed to say you know raise your hand. I can answer you. Um, but yeah. So the first thing is tech enablers are ready and will be ready soon. Um, what does it mean is certain technology because. I think as outsider, we might have, we might think certain technology happens overnight, but it doesn't. Um, usually, the certain technology is a result, is not the cause. Um, you know, they are like enabler one, um, that is, you know, making enabler two possible, then enabler two making enabler three possible, then all these stuff are making a certain application we see possible. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. The re only reason why you can ask Siri, um, say, what's the um, What's the population of France, for example? Um, you know, it's a, it's a mix of all different things. Firstly, speech to text, text to speech. You know, it's making your voice into text. So, okay, you are saying what's the population of France? So then it's the first layer of semantic mapping. You are asking a certain query outside Apple's main thing. Um, then it will go through, you know, Apple and uh, Wolfram Alpha's relationship. And Wolfram Alpha is like they spent like 20 years trying to solve the AGI problem, which is artificial general intelligence problem. And um, they actually have like their own language to deal with lots of different things. Um, by the way, if you guys want to learn more about AI and AGI, the, the first video I would re highly recommend is, um, I think, it's Steve the founder of Wolfram Alpha. He's a uh, lecturer in um, Stanford or MIT, I can't remember. It's like one and a half an hour. It will totally change how you view algorithm. Um, and the second thing I would like to say is, you know, we are passing the early adoption stage uh, from chatbot one to chatbot two. In fact, most of the people building conversational AI, they hate the word chatbot. Uh, it sounds boring and sounds cheap. Um, and if you go to some of the website, I wouldn't name it, um, 
actually that chatbot does five things. Um, say hello to you, say goodbye to you, say I don't know to you, and um, you know, tell you go to this site or go to that site. If you really think about it, like why do you build that? But lots of chatbots you deal with today are from that. However, during the during the phase of chatbot one, there was one thing happened, which is actually it, it doesn't you don't have to be a like really, really good engineering team to build a chatbot because you know because dialogue flow Louis was happening. I'll give you guys more details after this. Then I'm gonna talk about like the how the ecosystem is forming. Uh, in tech world, when people talk about ecosystem, people talk about like it's basically a package of different things. Um, think about kitchen, like um, you know, a company could be a certain vegetable. Uh, ecosystem is how do you you know package it up so that you can cook from raw meat vegetables into a great meal. That's an ecosystem. So um, I'll start with tech enablers. There are four main things I'd love to share. Um, some of the some of them you might you guys have, might have heard of them. Some of them is for your interest. If you want to give it a try, please go give it a try. Um, uh, the first part is more like NLP research and advancement. My original version version had a core NLP from MIT, uh, no, from Stanford, and my co-founder took it away, said, oh, it's out of date. So today, when people talk about like the core natural language processing research, people talk about open AI, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of deep fake. Um, you know, that thing they claim can make almost real news, and they didn't publish, and people are like, you're an open source company, you don't publish. Um, there's no right or wrong answers here, but they are doing lots of research on you know, natural language generation. And Google does lots of work, uh, of course, all the major universities do lots of work. Um, interestingly, in Australia, lots of the major universities here, our NLP research is quite advanced compared to our other area <coughs> of AI, such as computer vision. Um, yeah, if you guys have family doing computer vision research, please don't tell them I say that. Um, the second thing is more like the framework and the components. Um, I don't know, you know, I think today lots of actuaries, they do coding, they might use R, they might use Python. So uh, you, you, you might be familiar with framework and libraries. So framework is essentially a, um, you know, package of preset tools, so can, you can easily do a certain thing. Today, no software or no solution is built, um, you know, from scratch, from your first, like, you know, statement of giving a certain variable value. Uh, one example is, you guys have heard of NumPy, Pandas, um, they are they are library. It's like lots of people build these tools, so people like us can benefit from that. Uh, for natural language processing, there are some frameworks, and there are some libraries, and there are some components being great. Um, one thing, if you guys want to build your own chatbot today, uh, one thing you can check out, which is super easy, is dialogue, dialogue flow. Um, Dialogflow was a very small startup acquired by Google a few years ago. It's very simple. It's like you set up the intent, entity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then you can deploy it to a certain platform. Then you can start talking to it. A typical use case is order a pizza. Um, you know what flavor do you like? Where do you live? Um, do you want it now or later? Uh, size, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And my personal favorite is Rasa because it doesn't really require you to set up the complex rule. Actually, it's deep learning based. You can train your own model. However, it requires more labeled data. And at the same time, we have more other things such as the early, early adopter ecosystem, um, you know, Slack. Now, like lots of small companies, their whole distribution system, distribution channel is Slack. Um, we have a very simple tool we use internally. End of every day, everyone have five tackles. So you can um, give it to the team member you think who did a great job today, and um, that tackle can be given and it can be analyzed by end of the month, you get, you get a tackle master and a tackle master gets something sponsored by the company. And it's a very simple conversational thing. However, lots of the company are using this kind of like existing channel to distribute their great ideas in conversational AI. And the last one is um, the double-sided um, speaker, um, such as Alexa. Uh, Google Home, you might feel oh, actually its algorithm was advancing, but no, hardware was also advancing a long time ago. You can't do that. Um, think about like, you know, when Siri was on our phone, what you had to do was press a button if I remember correctly, but now you don't have to. Um, we may or may not notice it, but things are changing very, very fast. Cool. And um, 
the next thing I'd like to share is um, if you really think about the, the whole world around you, uh, we are passing the early adoption stage. For, for now, I think most people still see conversational AI as a toy. I still see like Siri as a toy. Uh, if you're really serious about certain things, you wouldn't go for Siri. If you're not so serious, like say I'll book a dinner with my friend, maybe you do ask oh, Siri, book a dinner with my friend. But if it's like book a one-on-one -on -one with your important stakeholder, you wouldn't do that. But people start doing that. Um, that's a thing. So it's actually moving from B2C to B2B or B2 enterprise. And uh, I'll quickly show you guys what we are doing so it makes sense out of the whole context after this. And also the second thing is we are starting having meaningful conversation because casual chat is difficult and easy. It's very difficult to achieve the open context, but it's very easy to reach customers because usually if, like I don't have any stake on this then fundamentally, if it has one or two issues, I'm fine with it. But when you go to more meaningful conversation, then actually it matters more. Um, and the last thing is toy becomes something normal. So I'll quickly show you what we are doing. Uh, it's not sales, but if you guys are interested, talk to me. <laughs> so um, a curious thing, we are conversational AI for high volume hiring. Think about you know um, when you guys were doing a graduate role, uh, you might send, I don't know, five, ten, you know, different resumes per day to different companies. And what we are doing is for high volume roles, we use conversational AI to interview all of them and give quantitative results. Um, today, I think in the industry, usually 95% of the candidates or CVs are ignored. So that's the kind of the thing we are trying to address. Um, let's say I was applying for an engineer role and um, I got this email saying call this AI. I'll put on speaker. Hello, welcome to a virtual interview hosted by Curious Thing. Please enter your four digit code followed by the hash key. Thank you. Your code is 11110. Please wait while I'm checking your code. Your interview role as engineer. Welcome to the AI interviewer of Curious Thing. My name is Christine. Thanks for joining me today. We will go through a short interview with a mix of technical and behavioral questions. I don't think there are right or wrong answers here. You can treat this as an ideas exchange and sharing session. Enough of me talking. I can't wait to know more about you. Let's start. What programming language do you use as primary tool? Uh, I mainly use Python for Python's great support of different machine learning libraries. As a data scientist, I've been using Python for quite a few years. Thanks. Are you familiar with Python frameworks such as Flask? If yes, how do you like it? Uh, yes, I am. Actually, can you repeat the question? Okay, let me see. Please give me more information about it. Can you repeat the question? Let me repeat. Are you familiar with Python frameworks such as Flask? If yes, how do you like it? Yeah, I'll try to stop here. So uh, sometimes with, um, with Echo, actually the accuracy of speech to text decrease quite a lot. Though for human, it's very different. That's another machine learning problem fundamentally because for machine learning, it looks at signal. It doesn't really look at it like a raw data. It doesn't really look at how we interpret it. But ignore that, um, you know, what we're doing is very, very simple. It's fundamentally, um, you know, ask lots of questions and with each of the question, ontology is attached so we can provide quantitative results. Then the hiring managers will have access to not just the audio, but all the, you know, quantitative results against each of the attributes we are trying to measure, then they can make decision not just based on the CV, but also some other information. So we can help them quickly, um, you know, do the decision making from 200 to 20 or 200 to 10. But we don't do the 200 to 1 because that requires lots of human intelligence. Anyway, 
If you really think about that whole experience, this is fundamentally what we are trying to address. Firstly, try to do something more for B2B. Secondly, utilize what AI or any intelligent system is good at, scalability. Because uh, if today someone tell you, hey, you know, this AI is better than human or smarter than human, uh, don't trust them. Um, today's technology is not that great yet. But there is only one thing today's AI, machine learning, or intelligence technology is good at is scalability. As human beings, no matter you know how hardworking you are, you can't interview 1,000 candidates per day. But with our system, it's very easy. So go back to the system. If we really think about what powers the application of this, it's like it looks like just a bunch of developers trying to do something. But under the hood, there are infrastructure and data layer, um, such as um, you know Google Cloud, AWS. They provide all the infrastructure so that you can build something on top of the cloud instead of having your own server. Second thing, platform and channel. Um, you know, we don't use that, but think about Slack, think about Alexa. Now, if you are like a really skilled developer, you can build an Alexa skill by yourself so that you can be part of the ecosystem. And when some people in, I don't know, um, in the US say, hey, uh, tell me a joke, maybe that will trigger your joke skill. Um, and the Alexa will tell them a joke. Uh, but you have to compete with other joke skill providers. So um, I don't know, you know how that works, but you know. Um, then it's information knowledge layer, which is fundamentally, um, you know, think about all the pre-trained model, think about what enables a certain thing, because there is no way everyone has all the data, even, even Google. So people rely on each other to make sure that at application level it works. Then it's application layer, which is essentially all the different things you guys see, you guys hear, and you guys experience. So um, I'll, I'll quickly wrap up. Um, the reason why I want to talk about conversational AI is firstly, that's a, that might be the only thing I'm familiar with. Um, if I, back a few years, I might be able to talk about like a GLM, but today, like, I, I can't. Um, but second thing, I also want to give you guys a bit of like, flavor regarding how a certain subdomain or certain sector or vertical of technology, how does it work and uh, what forms it. So we are more aware of the environment around us because um, believe it or not, like everything is changing so fast and we have to be aware of what's changing and how it's changed, especially the mechanism on the, on, on the, under the hood. Um, so that when we do, do our work, we know what's possible. Uh, I still remember very vividly uh, when I started being an actuary, I was like, hey, why don't we use R? And um, the answer I get, I, I can't say it's some cop, it's not. Um, the answer I get from my manager is, oh, it's open source software, it's not safe. Um, but then I was like, yeah, it sounds logical, open source, not safe. But to be honest, the safest software today is open source. Um, and because open source doesn't mean that you're open to hacker. Um, open source just means how people contribute to the code. And usually the support community is much, much bigger. And the second thing is um, recently, because I, I do lots of sales, I still see some of the very old uh, kind of like tech requirements saying we don't allow our vendor to use any open source software. But I'll be very honest with you guys. Today, that you will see zero software doesn't have an open source component. That's the reality. And even Microsoft, they've been struggling for so many years, but today, most of the things in their ecosystem, they utilize open source stuff. So if I don't go into a software engineer, I might still believe open source is not safe. But the, 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 actually, the reality is more and more people realize that Okay, technology is around us. We need to acknowledge it and we need to be aware of it. Then we need to use it. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is more like generic. It's about business transformation and it's also about, um, I can't say human transformation, but you know, about us. Um, so um, to start with, um, if you go to Silicon Valley, um, you know, everyone is going to share with you this. It's like the software is eating the world. And uh, recent few years, people are saying oh, AI is eating the software. Eating is not a bad thing in this context, by the way. Um, I'll give you some context so you, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, back a few years, when people talk about the CRM, um, they actually manage all, they all manage it either through the Microsoft CRM or they manage it by themselves. 
um, so like Excel spreadsheet, um, you know, even paper, Word, I don't know, uh, file, um, then CRM um, become like suddenly become a cloud-based thing. Um, you know, because of the Salesforce. So now they are like the top five or top 10 technology company in the US. And what they had was very simple. They were like, oh, you're a sales manager. Instead of, you know, doing this in a dumb way, just put that in cloud and your colleagues can see it. And you can see it, you can manage it faster. You can see it everywhere. And if you think about it, it's a very typical example of software changing how we behave. Today, there is no one using, you know, paper-based CRM anymore, no one. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, then if we think back like 20 years ago, what people were thinking, because by then software was quite easy to build, to be honest, not that difficult. But it's fundamentally because our software industry, they are trying to see which particular sector is not running in the most efficient way. They are trying to do something with it or eat it. So that's the nature of software. It's, it starts with scalability and automation. It doesn't start with intelligence. That intelligence is more for making this work better. And um, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I want to share with you from technology world how people think about everything. They don't think in the way that, oh, that's an interesting problem. I want to solve it. Um, usually people think that's a really boring problem and people hate it so much, let me solve it. So um, the second trend I would like to share in the whole technology industry or around us is <coughs> people no longer build platforms because the cost of building a great new platform is getting more and more difficult. Um, 30, 40 years ago, uh, if you think about like Microsoft, you know, bunch of guys, smart guys, um, build a system. Um, it covers quite lots of things, super, super, super successful. Then a few years ago, Salesforce, they were like, okay, we are not building a, like a massive operating system, but we are building a platform. So uh, lots of other people can actually put their stuff into my system, enable my sales manager to do not just what I provide, but also they, what they provide, and I have a cut out of the commission. But today, if you think about you know, the technology company, you might think about something, not Salesforce or Microsoft, they are like established, but more like UiPath. I don't know whether you guys have heard of it. It's a, it's a RPA company, and um, they recently ra raised, I think, 100 or 200 million USD. And what they do is very simple. They were like, okay, we don't give you a solution. Uh, we don't even give you a tool for all the problems. We give you the tool for a certain problem, but you can automate a certain thing on your desktop. Say every day morning, there's a guy called Jason sending me a message saying, do you want coffee? I say, no, don't ask me again, but he always does it. Can, what, can I automate this no every day? <laughs> um, you, with your path, you can. Um, but if you bring that into more like a business context, a lot of things could be possible. Um, if there's a meeting, um, you can actually say, hey, uh, did you prepare the agenda? If there is no agenda, or if there is a certain um, you know, thing happening, you want to check whether everyone is leaving before 6 p.m., you want to check again in one hour time, you can automate that. Think about what your iPad provide. It's basically some very fundamental building block. But with this, actually, you enable lots of things in the past only software developers can do. Now, every business person can do it. Twilio, very similar. It's, it's basically a communication protocol. Um, you want to reach out to 1,000 people, send them a short message saying, today's my birthday, give me something. Um, <laughs> you can either do that in your phone or you do that in Twilio. The good thing about doing that in Twilio is that you can do that every day. You can even do that with A-B testing. It's so like, uh, what's the response rate if I do that by 8 p.m. versus 8 a.m. about my birthday reminder? So all I'm saying is today every, you know, the technology business is moving towards a component-driven concept, which is everyone is not providing a huge solution. Everyone is providing a simple or a component of a solution, but provide it well. So as end users, we can assemble them. And then we can do something with our day-to-day -day life. And um, to to go that to 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 bring that and um, talk about this one step further, last year um, AWS during their reinvent 
um, annual similar. They said one thing to me is quite interesting. It's like we stop calling our engineers or you guys because the reinvent is like the engineers, um, you know, festival or something. Um, it's pretty nerdy. Um, <laughs> So um, they say, hey, we no longer call us or call you guys developers. That's not what's happening today. We call everyone builders. And you don't have to learn how to code to be a builder. So if you really think about the, all the solutions, I think within your business, you might use Redshift, you might use BigQuery. Think about why it's happening. Uh, in the past, actually, your engineer needs to work like three, five months to get a Teradata work. But now people are actually enabling the end user, which is us, mm -hmm. to build a certain thing with a certain problem in our mind. And is this the end state? Maybe not. So things are gonna be more and more convenient and we are gonna be more and more you know, happy when we want to solve a certain problem because they will be more and more readily used, usable tool for us to pick from. And uh, the last thing is, it's purely my personal sharing. Um, it's not about technology, but it's all about technology. Is um, you know, um, because the, the, I saw this like in paper actually. Um, um, it's like our lifelong learning is the only skill we need. Um, um, the the reality is, I, I truly believe in it um, because our life, I don't know, we might expect ourselves to live for 80, 100 years. Um, you know, I'm quite optimistic. Um, <laughs> and if we think, if we think, if we think through, and think about 50 years ago, what people were doing, and think about from our end in 50 years, what we will be doing. Um, I don't know, but there's one thing I'm, I know for sure is we won't be doing what we are doing today, uh, regardless if you're accountant, you're actuary, you're engineer. Um, you know, no matter what you are. Then um, the key thing is we should say yes to the new things and give it a try uh, at work, at our life, learn new things so that when, um, you know, this huge kind of like technology change or any change is happening in our life, we can happily say, hey, I'm ready. So um, yeah, I don't know why I want to share this, but I always share this in all the speak I do because I, I truly believe in it. And I feel as a country, if we want to be future-proof, us, we need to be future-proof. Um, so uh, the last thing is more my like my personal, not favor, but kind of. Um, it's like uh, just to introduce the startup ecosystem to you guys. Uh, most of the people don't really know much about startup. Um, just a bunch of guys couldn't find a job or a um, <laughs> bunch of guys who took the cool pill and think oh, I'm not for corporate consulting, I just want to do something cool. Um, yeah, kind of, lots of people like that. Um, but <laughs> if, if, you park, if you park that aside, um, the reason why I want to introduce this to you is because, um, you know, as a startup, we, we do want to be part of the bigger ecosystem because one, you know, we are one economy and it's one ecosystem. However, uh, most of the startup people, they only hang out with startup people and, you know, we see startup founders, startup em employees, and most of the people who work in startup, they never leave. And it's like a very close environment, which is great, but at the same time, um, I, 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 hope, I really hope I can, you know, encourage more people outside our community to join us. Just like, you know, when, you know, high school students ask me, um, should I do actuary? I would encourage them to, to do it. Though maybe lots of my advice is, is no longer valid. I can only tell them 10 years ago what actuary was like. Um, you don't have to be a startup founder to participate in this ecosystem. There are lots of events. Um, there are lots of um, you know uh, possibilities. You can work there. You can be an advisor. I know some of the like really great actuaries. They actually work um, as advisor for startup. Um, there are lots of fintech startups as well, and lots of insurtech startups, and um, they hire lots of actuaries. And um, you know you can just follow the news or participate the events. The whole thing I'm trying to say is, um, as actuaries, um, I really hope we have a very lifelong learning and open mind and um, learn some new things, uh, teach other people some new things, so our branding will be more like not just within financial services, but also beyond that. 
um, because what I notice is if I go to bank, I tell people I'm an actuary, people are like, awesome. If I go to technology, if I tell people I'm an actuary, mostly I get, um, what is that? Um, so now my strategy is I, I stop doing that, not because I feel, I, I just don't want people to, you know, to spend two minutes or three minutes explain this. But the reality is I really hope as actually everyone could know, oh, that's great, you guys are good at math, good at quantitative method, you guys are future proofing. So um, yeah, that's me, thank you. Thanks Dan for that very engaging talk, telling us all about, you know, giving us a sneak peek of natural language processing, conversational AI, and you know, the, the changing world and what it means for us. So to get the conversation, the discussion started, I'd like to you know, get your views on you know, the environment that we've got around us. And in particular, we're seeing over the last few years really an emergence of machine generated content. Whether that's GPT text models, you've got deep fakes videos, uh, you've got paintings from long dead artists being you know, created in new styles. And now of course, conversational AI and, and speech from you know, the series, the Alexis and Curious Things of the World it's becoming harder and harder to tell some of these things apart from real people. So I'm interested in your thoughts. Uh, one, as a producer of these services, what are the ethical considerations that you're thinking about putting these things into market? And then secondly, for us as consumers, how do we stay ahead of the curve and not be duped by these kind of things? Mm. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start with the, like lots of recent technology change and um, regulation change. So. In California, um, they just had a law saying, hey, if you're AI, just start with I'm AI, I'm not human. Um, I think this kind of law is great because fundamentally, there are lots of things could go wrong with this. Um, like, I'll give you an example. Our technology can easily convert into calling people and this can call like 10,000 people tonight and not asking them interview questions but some other questions. Uh, some people might be tricked. Of course, it's illegal and no one is going to do that. We won't do that. But maybe some people would. Um, with technology advancement, um, we massively reduce the cost of scalability. Because in the past, you have to, you know, maybe if you want to do something illegal, you have to knock their door. Then later you can call them. Now you can use AI to call them. The reality is we do need more regulation around the usage of intelligence system. Um, I know lots of people are talking about like ethical AI. Um, there was an institute recently formed, uh, founded by IAG and CSIRO talking about that. Um, at the same time, I do think regulation needs to acknowledge this, but not like say from what technology could be used or couldn't be used, but like mm -hmm. how should that be used in the way? Because in the end, it's machine human relationship. If we think about like say 100 years ago when we had like a first batch of cars, I'm sure we don't have the rule we had today, like you have to drive in this way, there's a roundabout, you wait for that guy to pass, then you do. We learn it, and but I really hope we learn it not in a hard way, but like in an easier way, because to be honest, if human build this, it's not that difficult to think what you human can use that for, and have some regulation around it, not just usage but also privacy, also about data. So yeah, I think that's a key thing. As um, as us, I would say stay open and um, be trustworthy that like, you know, trust that most people, the software providers, they are doing this for better, not for worse, and trust our regulators. Um, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I feel. Thank you. I now open to the floor for any questions. So I, I was wondering uh, what's the current status in terms of the machine to capture people's like emotion when they talk to the machines? Um, to start with, we don't analyze their emotion. Um, I know some people do. Uh, well, there are two ways you can analyze emotion. Firstly, you go into the, the, the we call it like the noise wave. Um, you can do that. There are some label data for that. The second way is go back to the text and do some you know sentiment analysis. Um, so how accurate it is, it depends on what is emotion um, because and depends on your training data. 
if you have four classes, I would say it's like super spiked, right? If you have like all different types of hybrid percentage allocation, that would be worse. Um, we, we don't do that because some people have got like boring voice. Like my voice is relatively boring, not like the most boring, but relatively. Um, <laughs> see, that's the thing I learned as actuary. Like it's all relative. Um, <laughs> uh, some people have got like exciting voice, but if you hire like say a uh, you know front desk, maybe they look excited is important. But most of the roles we help, it doesn't matter. We just focus on what people are saying. So yeah, in terms of accuracy, like really depends. And also it depends on whether you're talking about precision, recall, and which one is more important. So yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, so I noticed that you do a lot of interview questions with your pro um, with your products, but can you also tell when someone is lying? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> So um, I, I get this question from client a lot, so I'm, I'm quite uh, fluent on the answer. No. The um, <laughs> uh, reason, reason being this, um, I think that, that's, that, that actually goes back to the, um, you know, John, John's first question, which is like, I, I think as an intelligent system provider, you don't overclaim your, 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 your stuff. Um, so like of course if i have lots of data you know label data and um somehow i can tell like if people are lying or not but the reality is you can't because again lie is relative um say if i you know that that is not a machine problem to be honest and if i say i worked at suncorp for three years but i say i worked at suncorp for 10 years it's like is that 100 percent lie 50 percent lie or or what so machines good at dealing with problem that is clear. And certain natural language problem is not clear. Certain of them is. Like what people said, how do you semantically match them or map them into a certain space so you don't know if they're relatively good or not? That is clear. But go back to the lie thing, it's not clear enough. The second reason being even human to human, they lie. That's why, as a as a provider, we don't say, "Hey, that's the first person, that's the best." You hire him or her. Um, we just say, "Hey, we help you do the screening, give you more data points, then you make your decision." So, yeah, we we, we can't we don't overclaim, um, and we can't detect if people lie or not. I've got a question from the webcast. So, Sam, why did you choose to fix the high volume hiring problem? Uh, okay, the reality is, uh, okay, the, the more official and appropriate answer is I think there's a huge problem there and uh, lots of people are not treated fairly. Um, I'll give you guys one example, maybe you guys don't believe it. I was talking to Google India uh, two weeks ago. Um, they told us there was one row, it's like, apparently it's a great row in Google India. They had half a million applicants. Like, if you think about like this level of problem, like as a human, how do you do it? Like, I don't know. Um, you can do some keyword matching, you can do something, but you can't. I don't know whether he's lying or not. Like, even I don't know, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but like the thing is, you can't expect that it's huge volume. And that is a real problem. But the reality is when we started, um, we didn't think about high volume because data science hiring and engineer hiring were the only thing we know. We started with that. But no one wanted to use us because the skill is like, you don't have many great talents in the market. And those people who hire engineers and data scientists were like, I can't take the risk. I don't have like three good candidates. I'm going to go talk to them. And we acknowledge that it's not a problem we can solve. Um, you know, yeah. So then we change it to more higher volume hiring, call center, junior roles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one more question from the webcast. What are the new applications of conversational AI that excite you? Can you repeat that? What are the new applications of conversational AI that excite you? Uh, 
Last year, there was one thing that excites me, but later I realized that they are not deep enough. Um, there's an app called Calm. Um, I think it's called Calm. It's very simple, it's just trying to, it could be another name. There are two apps solving similar problem by using different approach. The only one is conversational AI, but what they do is just, you know, talk to you and make you feel slightly better. Uh, <laughs> it sounds really, it sounds really dumb, but it's helping you to reflect. Uh, every day is like, hey, how do you feel today? Um, you know, do you think you you feel better than yesterday? Because maybe apparently you shared that you were quite shit yesterday. Um, yeah, so that thing excited me. So I tried to talk to that thing for like one month, but I realized that it doesn't go deeper. It's like after three or four days, it's just robotic things. And I realized that okay, it's just collecting my data. Um, but I don't game, I I don't. <laughs> I don't mind. I don't mind people collecting my data because I know that they will treat my data in a way that they don't know it's me. Um, but yeah. you know, I don't gain much. Um, so, um, but go back to the technology bit. I, I really like how Rasa is doing their job. Uh, when I started using Rasa, um, they were like a pretty early stage company. They raised one point something million. Fundraising indicates the stage of startup. So they are like pretty much our current size. I think few months ago they raised 20 or 10 so they can build bigger. I think the execution of the solution is like awesome um, because I think their approach might enable more complex um, kind of like conversational AI building. The third one I want to share is uh, it's called Bot Society. Uh, it sounds really dumb. It's like it doesn't have any intelligence but you can build conversational AI prototype. Um, you know, on your phone or on a website. So if you have an idea, build it, show it to people, people are like, that's cool. Then maybe in your company, your next half year will be building intense model. So yeah, as, a, as you can see, I, I, don't, I don't favor the deep tech companies. I favor the companies who actually got a certain angle in their solutions. It's like people building conversational AI. So I give them very easy to use prototyping solution. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Sam. Hello. Um, just interested to know what's actually going on behind the scenes when you add like a web bot. Yeah. It's like if it's asking a question, have you kind of put in like here's some possible answers and it's going to try to classify that answer and then take an action based on that or is it more open ended or just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are two parts of the reasoning happening here. The first part is um, what should be the next question. That is relatively simple. Uh, the second part is after the interview, how the analytics were done. So under the hood, we are powered by two main type of technologies. The first part is knowledge graph. Uh, I don't know whether you guys know what's knowledge graph. It's a, it's a, it's a new type of database. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with SQL uh, structured database, Mongo, and Knowledge Graph is the semantic strong database. So relationship is a very strong and important thing in this thing. For example, Sam works at Suncorp. Uh, so Sam's entity, uh, Suncorp's entity, like important works at is a relationship that is have a strong entity. However, if you think about SQL database, it's purely just row, column, row, column, right? Um, so um, this was used for a long time by intelligence, uh, CIA, et cetera, et cetera, but now it's like lots of people start commercializing it. So we use that to drive the context uh, shift and we use deep transfer learning to deal with the small sample learning. So because there's no way we know what's good answer, what's bad answer in like a, thousands of different training data and how we do it is we assess whether people give like a strong reasoning, good supporting example at the same time when they are saying certain thing, are they giving something that is kind of like mapping to something we think that is kind of like a good topic space or relatively, we call it red flag topic space. So we combine them and give scoring. And um, important thing is we ask our client to, you know, look into the scoring in the first batch of candidates, make sure that they are aligned with the, the, the result then they will go for a larger batch. So that's how we do it from tech and commercial point of view. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we've got time for just one more question. Anything from the floor? Thank you. Um, in terms of like, um, you said about, um, 
like Siri and like Alexa is more like general purpose, artificial, like understanding ch of the chat, uh, like chatbot has more un general understanding, like general conversations, whereas your one is more like specific purpose where your context is more constrained, so you can expect less input from the user, I guess. But then, as you said, it's less, as a, less tolerance for error. So which one would you think, like, in your opinion, which one is easier and which one is a harder problem to solve? Um, I didn't say they are general purpose. They are more like for customers, right? And a um, few, few days ago, I saw like a, you know, someone shared that in Twitter. Um, you know, Alexa started laughing at midnight. Um, you know, it's pretty scary. So uh, <laughs> if, if you think about it, right, um, then what's going on? I don't know. Um, so yeah, but in general, I'm, I'm just talking about ignore all the conversational AI context. Um, in general, in B2C world, you know, people's tolerance is higher than B2B. I'm not saying that they, they, you can just give them random stuff, no, but the tolerance generally is higher. That's why most of like a pretty new technology go to B2C first. Um, if you think about it, like, you know, uh, your phone now, if you're typing, I don't know whether you guys know it, on your iPhone or Android, if you're typing Google, uh, not Google, dog, it will find all the dogs um, in your photo regardless if you tag them, I don't think, you know, any of you will tag dog. But if you're typing dog, if you're tagging kid, you will find the same thing. Um, who does it? Computer vision. And they, they actually put that in. And then later, you know, computer vision getting used in like cancer detection, et cetera, et cetera. So which one is easier? Um, I don't know, because B2B and B2C logic is very different. Um, for, for us to serve business and of course we hope we can, you know, every conversation matters and also your execution matters because the, the number of stakeholders and the number of steps are longer. So, um, but yeah, it's like everything's hard. That's my, that's my opinion, but hard in a different way. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, Sam, for taking the time to speak to us today. Thank Please you. join me in giving him one more round of applause.